Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to church this morning. We're so glad that you're here. Would you stand up to your feet with us? Let's lift up the name of Jesus in this place today. Come on, put your hands together. Let's go. Our God, the firm foundation, our rock, the only solid ground. The nations rise and fall. Strong now, shaking. We trust forever in your name. The name, the name of Jesus. Come on, sing it out. We trust. We trust the name of Jesus.
take communion together. So I'd like to invite the ushers to come forward and they're gonna begin to distribute the elements. If you would just hold on to that for a minute and we're gonna lead you through it. But at this time, let's just sing this song together. Let's sing Spirit of the Living God. Spirit of the Living God, Spirit of Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Goals are powerful. I don't know if you're like me, but maybe you have some goals. Maybe it's a certain GPA that you're hoping to carry out through the year. Maybe it's a school you wanna get into. Maybe it's a position that you're seeking in the workplace. Goals are extremely powerful. We're willing to endure much to be able to accomplish our goals. But the Bible doesn't talk a lot about goals. The reason is goals are rooted in you and I. Our ability to perform, our ability to produce. What the Bible does talk about is hope, a hope that's eternally secure in Jesus Christ. And that's what communion is all about, a hope that we have. The Bible says through his life, through his death, and through his resurrection, we've been justified. We've been declared not guilty, that we have full access to God. The Bible says that literally we're at peace with God now, that we're no longer children of wrath, but we're his beloved kids, his sons and daughters. And it's all because of Jesus. And so when we come into a moment like this, the Bible says that we can hope, that we can rejoice in this hope, knowing that when Christ returns, everything will be made right. But it takes another step further. It says, even in the midst of your sufferings, whatever you're walking through today, that those sufferings God promises us will produce endurance. And that endurance will lead to a character that is preparing us for the hope of eternity with Him. And that's what communion is all about, us continually coming back to Jesus, us continually coming back to the cross, coming back to his life, to his death, all the benefits that we've received that we're walking in. So whatever you're walking through, we can slow down in this moment and just begin to thank him. Thank him for the justification, the fact that we're righteous before him, that we're holy and blameless, not because of us, nothing that we're striving towards, but it's something that we can rest in. So let's hold up the bread together. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the bread. The bread represents your perfect body that was broken for us, your perfect sinless life that you live for us. God, we're so thankful for you. We're so thankful for you, Jesus. Let's take the bread together. Now let's hold up that cup. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the cup. 
We thank you, Lord, that the cup represents a new covenant, Lord, a better covenant because of the blood that's been shed for us. God, we thank you for all the many blessings, all the benefits, Lord, that we're walking in if we've trusted and put our faith in you. Let's take the cup together. Let's continue to worship. we thank you, Lord, for this morning. God, we thank you, Lord, for the ability to gather in your name. Jesus, we thank you, Lord, for, again, your life and the blood that you shed for us. God, we thank you for the peace that we have with you, Father, because of your Son and by the Holy Spirit. God, we pray that we would position our hearts in humility this morning to be able to receive from your word and to continue this process of change until you return. Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you would just remain standing for just a moment, we're going to greet those closest too. But before we get there, I'd like to first of all, just welcome all of our first time guests. If you're here with us at this morning at Milestone Church, and this is your first time, we want to point out to uh, you our communication card. It's located in the seat back just in front of you, and you're going to have plenty of time during the service. But if you would just take a moment and just write down just your name and your address, and here's what we'd love to do. We'd love to send you just a simple gift in the mail, just thanking you for enjoying joining us this weekend. And then we also want to just send you some information about Milestone Church so you can take your next step at a pace that works best for you and your family. 
We got incredible messages. We're preparing for our big fall series, Grow. Pastor Jed, one of my favorite teaching pastors is here. He's got a great word for us, but before he comes up, greet those closest to you and tell them it's great to see you at Milestone Church. Once again, we want to welcome you to Milestone Church. I also want to welcome those of you watching online. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with them with me to John chapter 15. If you don't have a Bible, we're going to put it on the screen. I also have it there for you in your notes. Now, you probably have realized that our summer has come to an end. Now, some of you are uh, parents have kids who are already back in school. The other ones of you who have kids are probably uh, making all kinds of preparations to get them ready to go back to school. Here's the one thing I've realized as a father of four. It's a lot of work to get your kids ready to go back to school. I mean, there's a lot of stuff to do. There's a lot of things that are expected of you to get them ready to be in a position so that they can have a great school year and grow into all that God's called them to be. I don't know if it was that way for our parents. Maybe it was. I don't know that we had pre-orientation for preschool. Um, I, I'm pretty sure that the colors and the numbers haven't changed. They're still the same, but we do a lot of work on the front end. And we appreciate all of you teachers who do that as well. There, there's something about getting ready for seasons of growth. You know, I think we realize this as a culture. Uh, we, we do it in a bunch of different areas, but sometimes I think we underestimate, we miss the value of what preparing to grow does for us in our spiritual lives. You know, I, I've been in ministry now about 20 years, and one of the things I've realized is so much of the pain, so much of the challenge, so much of the difficulty that people experience in life is a result of managing transitions, moving from one season to the next. Life is so much like that, isn't it? I mean, it, when we prepare to grow, what we're really doing is saying one thing is ending and another thing is beginning. Sometimes in our lives we look at things and we go, this, this is a great season. Things are going really good. The last thing I want is for it to change. We create expectations. Why did it happen? We get mad. Whose fault is it? Why does it have to be this way? Sometimes we're in a season where things are difficult. It feels like it's taking forever. We feel like Bill Murray in that old movie Groundhog's Day where we just live one day after the next and we're like, Lord, is it ever going to get better? Is it ever going to change? But I realize our ability to manage those transitions, to figure out what God's doing in our lives, to stay in sync with those things is so critical. Here's what I realized as I was praying and, and, and thinking about you this week. Here's one thing that's not optional. We're all getting older. Every one of us is getting older. Now we fight it, we push against it. Maybe some of you celebrate the same birthday, maybe you celebrate you're turning 25 for the 14th time, like somehow that you've, you've cracked the code, right? Anybody ever done that? Or you think like, I'm gonna try something new, I'll see if I can pull this off. And you think like, oh, man, I'm really thinking this is working. If you do that, you probably don't have teenage daughters because if you have teenage daughters, they tell you, right? Like, you think you're pulling something off? Now, now somebody said, hey, Pastor Jed, I like your jacket. Let's just get one thing clear. However I look when you see me on the weekend service, it's not a function of my style. It's my wife, right? I've just come to terms with the fact that I'm just, you know, just dress me, do that, help me. That's one less thing for me to have to think about. But my daughter will say, Dad, you're too old. My wife got me a hat. I was like, that hat's kind of cool. I'm going to put it to the side, rock it down low. She goes, Dad, you don't know how to wear a hat. I was like, what are you talking about? I was cool before you were alive. She goes, Dad. But it really, you know, here's the thing. Father time's undefeated. Whether you like it or not, we're all getting older. You know, one of those things that older people tell you, you know, like, you know, we, as you get older, you just stay the same in your heart. You know, your body starts to break down, and, but you're still you. I'm like, ah, that's what old people say. That's actually really true, right? Like the stuff that you like. I, I, I was, one time I was realizing this. I'll probably be a grandpa one day 
who likes hip hop and video games. Like I never met a grandpa who liked those things, but you just realize what you like, you like. Here's what I want you to see. Here's what I want you to appreciate. Everyone gets older, but not everyone grows. See, because growth requires preparation. Growth doesn't just happen. You have to be intentional. If you're going to grow, you have to have a plan. You have to be prepared. We're going to look and see what Jesus says about growth. He's very deliberate and intentional. It's very clear in his mind. It's not a guarantee. I think we realize this, right? Like in our world, we understand how critical preparation is. We're finishing up summer. One of the things I like to do in the summer, I don't know if you like this, I like to go to the movies. I love all kinds of movies, but in the summer, I want a big spectacle. Now, it's got to have a good story, but I want a spectacle. I, I was looking at the reviews before I saw Jurassic World, and, and one of the reviewers, I think he, he was being real smart and kind of snarky, and he said, in this movie, really all that happens is dinosaurs eat people. And I was like, what's wrong with that? I'm in. That sounds like a great way to spend an afternoon and eat some popcorn. I also love the superhero movies. I've always loved superheroes, loved them as a kid, and so now we get to see them, and I think our kids are spoiled, right? So I took my nine-year-old to see Ant-Man. He goes, Dad, Ant-Man, what does he do? He turns into ants. I was like, yeah, it's gonna be great. He goes, okay, we'll go see it, and uh, I went and saw it. He loved it. What he didn't realize was it took 10 years 10 years to get the script right, to get the actors right, to get the directors right. They were going to make the movie, then they stopped to make the movie. He doesn't know any of that. He just walks into the theater. He's like, that's a cool movie, Dad. And then you wait till after the credit's over, you do this. Credits end, and then there's another scene, and it's like, there's another Ant-Man coming back. And you're like, this is awesome. He just thinks he just show up. He doesn't understand all that goes into it. The superhero movies, they've, made, they've become so popular now, they're like coming to a theater in 2027. I was like, that's a little bit advanced notice, right? Like, I've heard of a save the date. That's pretty extreme. But we understand it takes preparation to do something significant. I don't know if you are like me. I love football. This time of year, I have this reoccurring dream. Now, if you ever played football, you probably had this dream a lot once they made you stop playing football. But you have this dream where all of a sudden in the dream, you're, you're the same age that you, you are now, but somebody comes to you and goes, Jed, we found a loophole in the eligibility. You can go back and play one more year. We got a spot for you. And in the dream, I'm getting I'm excited. I'm like, this is going to happen. I get to go back and all those moments of glory, relive them and even improve upon them. You say, maybe you need to see somebody about that. I, I think it's a good thing, right? I get excited. Now, if you like football, and there's a lot of people, you know, the Metroplex people move from all over the country, so we've got fans of all different teams. Of course, there's Cowboy fans. We've got Cowboy fans. We've got Seahawk fans, at least me and my family. We've got, we got fans of different teams from all over the country. You may like college. Maybe you like a and I saw a guy with the a and shirt or TCU. Maybe you like Baylor. Pastor Jeff Peltier loves LSU. I love the, the God's team, the USC Trojans. And so... This year, it's going to be interesting. Pray for our pastoral team. The preseason college football rankings, like four of, a, four of the top ten feature uh, the schools that the pastoral staff went to. It could be an interesting fall. But anyways, no matter what football team you like, here's what you're hope, hoping your team is doing right now. They're not hanging out. They're not on summer break. They're not just like going to show up the day before the game and go like, how's it going, bro? What's, what's been happening? What should we do? I don't know. Just run around and get open. I'll throw it to you. That's what we do. We don't want our teams to do that. We want them preparing. We want them practicing. We want them memorizing the playbook so when the game starts, they're ready to go. Some of you have fantasy football teams. Maybe I'm one of them. Now, some of you who have fantasy football teams, you know about preparation. You've been working on it for six months and your team's not even real. So we know <laughs> you're with me on preparation. Business works this way. School works this way. Business, the stock market works on projections and what are the third quarter earnings going to be? And we have a projection and then we invest on that. Maybe in your job, I don't know what your line of work is. Maybe there's a seasonal nature to your work and you get ready. Teachers certainly understand. There's lots of preparation. They're working extra long hours right now. Maybe whether you're in taxes or in sales or you're in marketing, you're doing a pitch that takes preparation to get ready. But in some way and then for some reason, when it comes to our spiritual lives, we forget all this. We say, well, I'll get to that someday. When my life settles down, when, when my career gets to where it's supposed to go, or when once we get our first house, or once I get married, or once we get kids, or once we get the kids off the school, there's always a reason to put off spiritual growth, but it's so important in our lives. If we're going to become who God's called us to be, it won't just happen. We have to be intentional about it. One of the things I've realized is 
many times, it's hard for us to get this. The only catalyst we have for growth is pain. It's crisis. This summer, we spent the summer praying for prayer requests. We do this multiple times throughout the year. And when you have a serious prayer need, when someone in your family gets a life-threatening uh, illness, when, when you lose your job, when your marriage is in trouble, in those moments, you don't go like, I'll do it later. You go, God, right now, I need you to help me. I need my marriage, my business, my career, my body, my physical body. I need it to grow. As I was thinking about this weekend and thinking about our fall series, my prayer for us as a church family was, let us be the kind of people who it doesn't require just pain or crisis or challenge, but let us be the kind of people who grow because we're close to God and we know that's what he has for our lives. Let's look now at John chapter 15. Great passage of scripture. Theologians call it the farewell discourse. Here's what it means. Talk about major life transition. Jesus is about to die on the cross. I would say that qualifies. And he's been preparing his guys. He's like, guys, the Son of Man came to give his life as a ransom for many. He's like, guys, I'm going to die. I'm going to be buried. And they're like, Jesus, stop talking about that. He goes, guys, this is not a joke. This is not, a, this is not something that's subject to debate. We're not going to vote on this. This is going to happen. And they're getting very close now. You can imagine in those moments, they leaned in. Imagine th that final thing that you would say to someone. You're emotionally invested, you're engaged, you're passionate, your voice might tremble. And this is where we find Jesus talking to his disciples in John 15. Look what he says here. He says, I'm the true vine, my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch... While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, which is another way of saying cutting, so that it will be even more fruitful. You're already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Now at this point, you're probably thinking what many of the disciples were thinking, and that's this. Jesus, what in the world are you talking about? You're a vine and we're fruit. What does that mean? What are you even saying? Jesus here is using a metaphor. One of the things I love about Jesus too is he goes first. He includes himself. He's beginning to give them insight into what it takes for, um, for them and for us and for any of us to grow in the things of God. And I love that he includes himself first. He says, this is what I do with my father. This is what I'm modeling for you. This is what I'm inviting you into. Now, you might be saying, well, well, bear fruit, what does that mean? I'm not very good at gardening. I don't know about you. I have a black thumb. My dad and my mom and dad are great gardeners. That didn't get translated somehow. Maybe it's my lack of patience or whatever. But for some reason, I can't grow stuff. But it's not talking about literal growth. It's a metaphor. And here's what it's saying. What Jesus is saying is that when a tree grows and bears fruit, what happens is, What's on the inside of it, the things that are on the inside of it begin to come outside. Whatever's in there comes out, and it always comes out, you know, you know, an apple tree doesn't produce grapes. An apple tree produces apples. And what Jesus is saying is, when you're tied into God, when you remain in God, when God begins to work in your life, you start to bear the fruit. What's on the inside of you starts to look like what's on the inside of God. The Bible says in the book of Galatians that the fruit of the Spirit is love and peace and joy and kindness and self-control. What Jesus is saying is when you stay connected to God, the things that are a part of his life, his characteristics, his traits, his desires begin to come out in your life. Look what he keeps, as he continues, look what he says. I'm the vine, you're the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you'll bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. That's a pretty strong statement. If you do not remain in me, you're like a branch that's thrown away and withered. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. Again, very strong. We sure hope he's using a metaphor there. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. What an incredible promise. So we see promise and we see strong challenge in the passage. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. What Jesus is saying is, when what's on the inside of God starts to come out on the inside of you, it gives God glory, it gives him honor, it helps others to see, I want my life to be connected to God. Look at how it finishes for, for here in verse nine. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commandments, you'll remain in my love, just as I've kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I've told you this, so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may complete, may be complete. My command is this, love each other 
as I have loved you. Now, there's a lot there in the passage, but for the sake of time, I want to look at what does this passage say about growth, and in particular, spiritual growth, because I love what Jesus is doing here. There's a cadence. There's a rhythm. He's repeating himself. He's pressing in on a couple ideas that I want you to see, and I want you to think about what could this look like in my life and in your life? Well, here's the first thing. What does the passage teach us about growth? The first one is this. God designed us for growth. He made us for it. Now, if you look close back in the first verse, he says, if you bear fruit, he prunes you, which is another way of saying cutting. If you don't bear fruit, he cuts you. So whether you do or you don't, we all get cut. That cutting is a picture of change. That cutting is a picture of back to what we talked about, a season being this way and then it coming this way. Now, I don't know how you feel about change. Change can be difficult for me. My wife will tell you I can be resistant to change, especially if I don't understand what the change is going to benefit me in my life. I think many of us feel this way. When we're asked to change, when we start to get cut on, we're like, why are we doing this? Isn't there a different way to do it? My wife, one of the ways she's been wanting me to change, she's wanted me to exercise more regularly. I'm a little bit like a dog in the fact that I like to exercise by chasing a ball, right? So if you tell me, let's go play basketball, let's go play football, let's go play soccer, I'm in. If you tell me, let's just go run and lift stuff for no reason other than we should do it, I'm like, what is the point of that? But for apparently, there's a whole group of the the population who lives this way. So my wife goes, let's go to the CG thing. So I start going. And she's like, isn't it awesome? And I'm like, no, it's definitely not awesome. She's like, don't you love it? Don't you want to do it more? I was like, no, I hate it. And, uh, but I love you. And so here's what I'll do. I'll I'll do it. So beginning of January, I committed to do it. And I have this same routine all the time. We do it early in the morning. We get up, the alarm goes off or she wakes me up and I get into this conversation between my mind and my body. And when I'm not a morning person, and in the morning, my body is way smarter than my mind. My mind goes, Jed, there's the alarm. It's time to get up. It's time for us to exercise and to live a responsible life. My body goes, your mind is an idiot. I read a study last week. What we really need is sleep. I was like, good point, body. And uh, so I lean back to go to bed. But my mind and my wife keep working on me. So finally, I get up and I go. And then I go to work out. And uh, the trainer's laughing at me, and I'm like, okay, I shouldn't have taken five weeks off. And they think it's hilarious. And I get to the end, and I, I'm like, I'm sweaty, but I go, you know what? I do feel better. That was a good choice. And although I hated it, I think I should change. See, some of us change. You're like me. Change is hard for you. You wouldn't choose it on yourself. It kind of has to be sprung on you. But here's the truth. Whether we like it or not, we don't really get a choice. Change is coming. Wherever you're at in this moment of your life, we're getting ready to start our internship. I always tell the interns this. I was like, this is going to be challenging. This is going to be difficult. God's going to force some things into your life that are going to be hard at times. But here's the good news. God's going to use it to help you grow. And they're like, really? And they're like, we just feel so busy. I was like, let me just help you something. I got good news and bad news. They're like, here's the good news. The good news is, if you're busy, that means that God trusts you and he he puts things on your plate and he really thinks that you can do a lot for his kingdom. Here's the bad news. The faithful handling of responsibility is rewarded with more responsibility. So if you keep loving and honoring God, you'll never be less busy than you are right now. Isn't that awesome? They're like, no. And, And really, I think that's what we all have to come to terms with. We come to moments in our life and there's a new season, a new responsibility. We go, man, this is hard. This is difficult. We trust, we change, we grow. God starts cutting on things in our life and all of a sudden we go like, you know what? I think I figured this out. I told you I have four kids. And we love people who have, if you're having a child and if you're, you're a new parent, we, we salute you. We want to help you. We're going to stand with you. We're going to encourage you. But I'll just give you a little insider information. Those of us with four kids to those of you who have one kids, we love you. We know it's hard for you. But someone with one kid is someone who has a hobby, really. I mean, <laughs> that's cute, right? Like, when I had one kid, she used, to be, she used to, you know, sleep in a college dorm. She used to hang out. She'd go everywhere we went. But, but here's what happens. When you just have one, it feels like your whole world's caving in on itself. But what happens is you start to grow, you start to develop, and you realize, man, God entrusted me with one. You're faithful. He gives you another. We're going to keep changing and growing if we obey God. That's challenging. That's difficult. We keep having to start over. We think, I'm done giving. I'm done serving. We, he's only setting us up for more giving and bigger asks. Here's the second thing. Spiritual growth is far more relational 
than it is intellectual. Now, this might be one that comes to us as a surprise to you. The first one, you know, it kind of makes sense. We're designed to grow. This one, a lot of times when I say this is a season where we're going to grow as a church family, what you think I'm saying is we're going to read a bunch of books and study stuff. There might be a test involved, and this is the internship guy, and he's setting us up for this thing. Here's what I want you to realize. If you think spiritual growth is measured by how much you know, you've missed how the Bible defines spiritual growth. Look what Jesus says here. He doesn't say learn stuff, memorize stuff, read stuff, intellectually ascend to things. All those things are great. I believe you can worship God with your mind. Of course I'm for education. I have a master's degree. I'm thinking about getting more degrees. But make no mistake, spiritual growth is way more relational than it is intellectual. This makes me think of being in school again. I don't know if you can... Believe this or not, this may come as a surprise to you, but when I was in school, I was a little bit of a handful. And uh, you're going like, we believe that. And uh, I was thinking about that this week. My second grade teacher was a really sweet lady. Her name was Mrs. Gudgel. And uh, Mrs. Gudgel tried her best to kind of corral me and keep the classroom environment sane. And I would get my work. I loved school. I'd get my work done really fast. And then i just kind of just go crazy in the classroom. And I'd go to the back. What's happening back here, guys? And I'd cruise around. The one place I was not was in my seat. And uh, my wife joked, she's like, if you'd have been in school today, they would have diagnosed you with a bunch of stuff. And I laughed, and then I was like, wait a minute, why? What are you, what are you, what are you talking about? Um, so here's what Mrs. Gudgel did. She got this idea. I pressed her so far. She scotch taped me to my chair. I, my first thought was like, man... I must be rough on Mrs. Gudgel. She's gone to this part. Like, I feel bad. Like, she's probably having a hard day. I only had that thought for a second. Here was my second thought. Scotch tape? Like, what does she think? Like, I'm weak? I was like, watch this power team. I was just like, raw. <laughs> Didn't end there. I went to middle school, and I remember one time I had a substitute teacher. This is not a joke. Still doing my same pattern, do my schoolwork, then just stir the whole class up. Again, I know that's hard for you to believe. Substitute teacher comes to me and goes, Jed, we've had a rough week. Here's what I need you to do. Just stay out of everybody's way. Just try your best to be quiet. If you can do that, when class is over, we'll go get a soda and candy. I was like, where's this been all my life, right? I was like, deal, right? And so we go, and she's like, the, the substitute was like, somebody else can worry about it next period. I just want to get out of this class. It continued by the time I went to college, right? I was in school. I was like, I got to get 4.0 all the time, honor roll, because it'll get the best job. I didn't necessarily want to be friends with my teacher, but I'd show up for office hours. I'd be like, okay, professor, here's what I need to know. What's it going to take for me to get the best grade in the class? And he would be like, I'm not sure you're going about this the right way. I was like, yeah, yeah, whatever. Tell me what to do, right? And it's funny, and maybe, maybe you're like, you got problems. Well, I'm dealing with them. But here's the thing. <laughs> it's one thing if you approach school that way, but it's a whole different thing if you approach your relationship with God that way. But I think we do this. God, tell me what I need to, to, to pay the least and to get the most. God, tell me how to make my, uh, my career come true or tell me how to meet the perfect spouse or tell me how to make my kids work. God, I don't really want you, but I want what you can provide in my life. And we're looking for, for life hacks. We're looking for secrets for three steps to a better this and four steps to a different thing. When the greatest thing God offers us is not answers or not solutions or not ideas, the greatest thing he offers us is himself. See, Jesus uses this metaphor of a husband and a wife to represent Jesus in the church. And, and we're getting ready to celebrate 20 years of, of marriage. One of the areas where I have grown a bunch is as a husband. I remember being about five years into marriage and having an alarming experience. We would we'd go out to dinner with a couple. My wife and I would go out to dinner with a couple. And when you go out to dinner with a couple, you know, you do the dance. And it's kind of like, uh, tell us your story. So I was like, okay, here's our story. She was 20 and I was 22. And yeah, we were young, but it was awesome. We knew what we were doing and we got into things. And marriage was great. And we just, it, it was fantastic. And then my wife goes, the first two years of our marriage were a living hell. And I was like, that's hilarious. You're joking, right? And she's like, no, no, I'm serious. I was like, but you were married to me, right? So we get in the car on the way home. I was like, you're really joking. You laid it on a little thick about the living hell. She's like, that wasn't a joke. I was like, what do you mean? I was awesome. I'd come into the room. I'd be like, honey, how's everything going? I was like, I only said uh, that's not how my mom cooked it one time, right? Like, we all get do-overs. What about grace, you know? And I'd come into the room. I'd be like, honey, how are you doing? Good. All right. Great talk, right? And then I'd come back. Why are you crying? I really... I thought, you know, like I'd read a few books. I had a couple. I could do this. I could figure this out. And what I realized wasn't about figuring it out. It wasn't about rules. It wasn't about a checklist. It was about the heart. 
This week, uh, my nine-year-old, who I told you I like to take the superhero movies, he, the apple didn't fall far from the tree, and he gets pretty stirred up about stuff, and we were sitting together in the room, and Sarah and I were trying to talk about something. He asked me roughly 120 questions in the span of 30 seconds in a row, and so I had the thought, son, have you read your Bible today? And he goes, no, dad, why'd you ask that? I was like, go read your Bible. He goes, okay. So he takes off running. He comes back up the stairs literally two minutes later. I was like, son, you're done already? He goes, yeah, dad, did it. I was like, what'd you read? He goes, oh, I read something in Psalms. I was like, what'd you read? He goes, I don't know, but I read it. And I was like, okay, here's what I need you to do. Go back downstairs, go back to Psalms, and read Psalms 119. Now, if you don't know, that's the longest chapter in the Bible. So I said, go read Psalm 119. When you get it figured out, come back upstairs, right? So like 15 minutes later, Dad, how much do I have to read? So he comes back upstairs. I was like, son, what do you remember this time? Well, I read some stuff. I was like, well, let's look at this verse. And I put it there in your guide. Psalm 119, 105. I said, son, what does this say? He said, well, Dad, it says, your word is a lamp to my feet. I was like, what's that talking about? What, is it, what does the Bible mean when it says your word? Well, it says, he said, Dad, I think that means anytime God says something. So it could be the Bible, or it could be something that when you're praying, God says to you, or something, uh, something that you feel like, or something somebody else says to you that you feel like is coming from God. It could be any of those things. So that's good, son. But what kind of a light source is a lamp? Is it a really big light source, or is it small? He said, no, Dad, it's small. It's like a flashlight. He said, a lamp, you really can only see a couple feet in front of you. I said, well, that's interesting. Why do you think the Bible says that God's word is like a light that you can only see a few feet in front of you? It's like, I don't know, Dad. I said, well, let's keep talking about it. What's this path thing? He goes, what's a path? He said, well, Dad, it's like a trail. I was like, that's right. What's on a trail? He said, well, there's rocks on a trail, and there could be some branches. There's lots of things that you could trip over and fall down. I said, that's really good, son. What do you think this passage is saying? We started talking about what this passage is saying is God's word, God speaks to us in a way that, uh, the thing about a lamp or a flashlight, it moves with you. It has to keep coming with you, and it gives you only enough information to take the next few steps so that as you walk, you don't trip over the things that would keep you from going where God's called you to go. He's like, that's really good, Dad. And we started talking about it. I said, son, here's what happens. What a lot of people want is not a lamp. They don't want a flashlight. They want a spotlight. They want the whole sky to be lit up. They want a GPS navigation that's going to tell you it's going to take you 12 years to get here. And when you get here, this is what it's going to look like. And when you get here, this is what it's going to look like. But I said, son, the thing about walking with God, it's not about what we know or how much we've done or what classes we take. It's our ability to hear his voice and to walk closely with him every step along the way. See, the passage there says, apart from me, you can do nothing. If you're trying to do what I was trying to do, if you're trying to figure out the secret to, to cutting corners and to getting there as fast as I can, that verse is terrifying. Because what it shows you is this, apart from, you, uh, apart from him, you can't do it. You trying to figure out, this is what we've done for many of us in culture. We've taken the gospel and we've reduced Christianity down to, I try my best to be a good person, to be spiritual, to do good things, and if I'm better than most people, then God becomes obligated to me to give me the life that, that I always wanted. The problem is that lifestyle is so frustrating and exhausting because you're not good enough, and on your own, you can't do it. You might be better than some, but you'll never be able to be perfect and to be in fellowship, to walk with Jesus, as Pastor Ron said, you have to have his righteousness. The gospel is not what you do to make God love you. The gospel is while you're a sinner, on your worst day, on the thing that you're most ashamed of, in that moment, Jesus came and he took your place. He took the punishment that you deserved. And then he turned around and he gave you the ability to live the perfect life that you were created that you never could have done in your own strength. The gospel is not what we do for God. The gospel is about what's been done on our behalf that allows us to live a life we couldn't live any other way. Here's the third thing about growth this passage teaches us. Genuine growth is demonstrated through our love for others. In verse 12, the last verse we read, Jesus repeats it again in verse 17. This is my command, love each other as I have, as I have loved you. Now, when you hear that, it makes sense. This is a very Jesus-y kind of thing to say. It's what Jesus would say. Love each other the way I loved you, which on the surface sounds like, okay, I'll just try my best to love some people. And we pick the people who are easy to love. But when you understand what he's saying, you realize this is impossible. 
I don't know about you, but Jesus didn't just love those who loved him in return. Jesus loved those who were far from him. Jesus loved those who hated him. And I don't know about you, but I'm just not that good. I'm not that strong. You might th- look at someone who's a pastor or someone up here and you think like, well, it's easy for them. They wake up every day and, and God meets them and it's just like, who can I love today? And I will find the angry atheist and the person who emails and the person who gets on my nerves and I will go and I will serve them and I will love them and that's what I get to do my whole life. It's the best. I love it. <laughs> that's not how we live. I live where you live. Part of my summer, we went, a uh, phenomenal trip. We took 150 missionaries to the Dominican Republic, and it was an incredible time, and God did amazing things, but I was confronted with the reality of my inability to love very early on. The first day we went, you know, my, my daughter and I had gone once before. We were going again. I've, I've done missions trips all over the world, and it always changes your life. It always impacts you because you see God in a different way, but, but we were going, and, and she goes, Dad, why aren't you more excited? I said, baby, I am excited. I'm just pacing myself because I know it's going to be a big week. It's going to test us. I wasn't wrong on that one. So the first day we go, we get to the airport, we wake up at three in the morning, and you know how I am as a morning person, and we get there at four in the morning to the airport, and everybody's greeting each other, and we're all excited, and we're checking in bags, and then we're standing in line, and then we're waiting, and then we're on a plane, and then we're standing in line, and waiting for bags, and then we're outside, and it's hot, and there's crowds, and there's people pressing, and we get a small piece of a sandwich, and then we hang out in the park, and then it's like, go walk around on a beach, and it's humid, and that's perfect for my skin, and, and we're hanging out, and then they're like, we worship for a while, and, we, and, and all of a sudden now, it's like, we started the day at three in the morning, and now it's seven, and we've been worshiping, and it's been awesome, and we've been hearing preaching, and it's been inspiring, and we're like, let's go do this thing, and they go, okay, we're going to break out for dinner, so team leaders go out into the hallway, we got pizzas for you, so I'm like, this is good, we'll get some pizza, the students are hungry, we'll get them all fed, and everybody will be ready, and, and then I realized, wait a minute, Jed, um, you're a long way from going to sleep, because you got to go back to the hotel, you don't even have a room, you threw your bag into a mystery bag room, and your bag may or may not be there when you get back, so you got that going for you, and so I'm trying to say, like, don't worry about it. It's going to be okay. And so we get to the pizza and they go, okay, everybody listen for your church and we'll tell you how many pizzas we have for you. And uh, the room was so packed in, it made the atrium on Easter weekend look like luxury cruising. And I could have body surfed to the pizzas. And so by the time I get to the front of the pizza, they go, 34 pizzas for Milestone Church. I was like, awesome. I'm here for the 34 pizzas for Milestone Church. They're like, we got no pizza. Sorry about that. Something went wrong in the way we passed them out. Now, I'd like to be able to tell you I walked away from that moment and was like, that's okay. Lord's going to move. We'll just get some loaves and fishes and maybe like Elijah, the ravens will come bring us some pizza. That's not my first reaction. I tried to look that way on the outside. On the inside, I was like, Lord, smite these Philistines. Your servant is hungry. He is famished. He has been in the heat. He is laying down his life. He's pouring out his life like a drink offering. Lord, need I remind you, we're not going to bed till one in the morning, and that's like 22 hours in one day. I was like, yeah, amen is right. I was like, Lord, you need to just, remember what you did with Elijah? Call down fire on these people. We can love them later. Lord says, son, are you done yet? I was like, almost, and uh, I was sharing that story last night. One of the team members came up, and they go, Pastor Jed, you really felt that way? I was like, absolutely, that's how I felt. He's like, I'm so glad. He goes, I was standing there, and I'm sitting in that hotel. I'm sitting there in Miami. I go, I've made the worst mistake of my whole life. (laughs) See, on the outside, and here's what I did in that moment. Theology didn't teach me this. Seminary didn't teach me this. The only proximity in that moment was the fact that Jesus put his arm around me. He said, son, the only way out of this is if you stop thinking about you and make it your goal to love someone else. It's like, ah, that cuts. This is that pruning part. And so I said, I'm just gonna do that. I'm just, who can I serve? And I'm just like, I'm gonna keep this attitude the whole week. And here's what I realized. The more you get your eyes off yourself, the more you stop worrying about your own comfort, the more you stop making your needs, your comfort the top priority, the more God can use you and the closer you are to what he's doing and what he's gonna do whether you join him or not. He's inviting you into it, not because he needs you, but because you need him. 
So what happened is, as my heart began to change, then I could coach others, and really, they were doing great. They were serving, and they're like, it's no big deal, we can make this work. And here's what happened. As a result of us saying, our goal is not about us, our goal is about how can we love others. Every single person on our 150-person team led someone to Christ. Many of them preached publicly for the first time. They did street preaching. I'm not talking about by the street. I'm not talking about coming into an, uh, an event where there's a stage and people waiting to talk to you. I'm talking about you're on a street. They block off the street. We had a guy on a bike. He, he, they were on a motorcycle, a little motorcycle, this guy and his buddy, and they were driving to go through where we were doing our deal, and the guy on the back was holding a washing machine. That's not a joke. Our translator stops them. I was like, this brother's bold. He stops them, grabs the washing machine, sets it down. He's like, you can't go through. Might as well listen, right? In the street, people would never preach. Preaching hundreds of lives, giving their life to Christ. Every single person who went on that trip, if they had the time, they'd come in here and they would tell you, we don't see God the same. Something changed on the inside of us that's never going back. And it wasn't just because they learned something or they got something in their head. It's because they said, God, you've created us for this. We want to do this out of our love for you, and we want to love others. That's how we measure whether or not we've grown. Before I pray for you, here's the good news. You don't have to go on a mission trip to grow. It'll definitely help you. But all the things that cause those people to grow, myself included, you can do here. We can do it as we enter into the fall. There's three things I want us to think about. What does this look like for us to practically apply that? Here's the first one. You gotta make a commitment to your growth. You gotta decide. We have options in our culture. I was driving to church this morning. People going all different kinds of places. Some maybe made the Saturday night switch, but the rest decided there's something more important than developing myself spiritually, than being connected to Jesus and the body of believers he's placed me in. You have to decide, I'm gonna prioritize this. You have to say uh, a no to some things in order to say yes to the things that matter most. We're getting ready to start our internship. If you're interested, you can still apply. Our table's out there. Whether you're a high school senior, we're doing that for the first time, or whether you're later in life, all we're trying to do is help you get ready for that next thing that God has for you. And here's what I've seen. We've had people who have seminary backgrounds and who've been in ministry, and, and people who have very little background at all, newly saved. The, none of those things are the single indicator that determines how much they grow. The people who grow every semester are the people who prioritize it, and they commit. They say, God, it's gonna be difficult. It's gonna be challenging but I'm gonna make this a priority. That's all we're asking you to do. Say, I value growth. I wanna be intentional. Here's the second thing. We want you to engage with our fall series. The fall series is a big thing for us. We spend nine months, a year, multiple years, thinking about how do we give our church, we know this is a great opportunity. This is the window in a season every year in the life of our church where people engage, where people press in. We want you to engage in our fall series. We want you to prioritize the weekend service. We have, I know you got busy things, we've all got busy lives, but do your very best to come as regularly as you can because if you make that commitment, I'll promise you this, you'll grow. We're not trying to boost attendance for the sake of feeling good about ourselves. We know God has something great for you and if you'll apply yourself, you'll be amazed at what he can do. We want you to prioritize weekend service. We want you to participate in a small group, maybe lead a small group. And here's the last thing. If you're a visitor or if you're just joining us for the first time, you, we're not necessarily putting this one on you. But if this is home, if this is a family, the third thing I want to say is this. We want you to pray and ask God what you should give to our REACH campaign. This is a moment. We, we have a miracle offering coming at the end of September. We can't stay here. We've come to a transition moment. We need God to move. And here's what I want you to hear. Please hear this. I've lived a lot of different places across the country, and every place I've lived, churches have grown. And I'm not putting that on me, I'm putting that on God. And when your church grows, you, ha you realize if we're gonna keep growing, we have to make space for people, because it's not good enough. There's still people out there who are far from God. And as great as what's happening in here in our lives and in the lives of those we love, this isn't all God's asking. We gotta make room for those who are not yet here. So everywhere I've gone, I've given. I, I, I've never even been to some of the buildings that I've given to. And, and I don't say that to brag on myself. This is the normal Christian life. When you care about what God cares about, when you love people who are far from God, you sacrifice and it's not a big deal. You don't pat yourself on the back. But here's what I want you to see. When you do this, you're connected to him in a different way. It stops being about, was that good? Or did I like the worship? Or did I see so-and-so? It's like, God, I'm, I'm, I'm engaged, I'm thinking about who's coming, I'm thinking about who's not coming, I'm thinking about how do we serve, how do we make a difference. We're not asking you, we're not telling you what to give, all we're asking you is to say, Jesus, what do you want me to do? 
And whatever that is, we're asking you to do that. And here's what I want you to see. Just like those people who went on that missions trip, when you love, when you give, when you serve, God sees to it that you always get back in your soul more than what you gave. Will you pray with me? Jesus, we want to be a people who grow. God, it's an incredible privilege. Lord, you offer us the opportunity to be in you. Lord, this passage in verse 14, you actually call the disciples your friends. What a promise. Lord, you, you, you say in chapter 14 that, that if anybody loves you, your father, and you and your father would love them and that you'd make your home in them. God, we want to be the kind of people who don't just grow in crisis, who don't just grow in need, but who grow because we walk with you, we live with you, and we're connected to you. God, I'm praying as a church family, I'm praying that this fall season would be the greatest moment of growth in the history of Milestone Church. Not so that our name would be great, not so that we'd have full services. God, that your name would be lifted up in our region and many who are far from you. Lord, uh, families that are falling apart and, and marriages that are about to break and people who are at the end of their rope. Lord, people who think that they've got it all together would meet you in such a powerful way that their lives and history would never be the same. God, we're asking that you do that in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to ask our ushers to come down. We're going to continue to worship through a time of giving. Thank you so much for being a generous church. I'm not trying to inspire you or to challenge you to be something that you're not. You already are this. Thank you for giving online and uh, thank you for giving in service. Your generosity allows us to do all different kinds of things that you'll see all this fall, all different kinds of events for our community to love and serve them. Your generosity helps make that possible. Would you pray with me, Jesus? It's a privilege. Lord, to give back to you what's already yours. Here are our tithes and offerings. God, we give them cheerfully, not out of compulsion or duty, but because we love you, we pray that you take every resource, that you'd multiply it for maximum impact in your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm Terry, and I just want to take a second to let you know about some things coming up for you and your family around here. One of our favorite things is to see people follow the Lord in water baptism. Maybe you're new to a relationship with God, or maybe you've had one for a while now, but you've never been water baptized. August 29th and 30th is your weekend, and there's no better place to experience a moment like this than with your church family. Now, if you've got some questions and want to learn a little bit more about this next step, we're having a water baptism class next Saturday, August 22nd, after the 6 p.m. service. Our children's class will be held in the factory, and our adult class will be held in the video cafe. It's simple and easy to register online at milestonechurch.com baptism. Well, summer's almost over, and the 2015-2016 school year is just around the corner. And here at Milestone Church, we want to honor the teachers and administrators in our community. We know that this profession is more than just an occupation. It's a calling to impact the next generation. So next weekend on August 22nd and 23rd, during all of our weekend services, we'll take a moment to pray over them and bless them with a special gift. If you or someone you know is a teacher or administrator, grab an invite card in the Info Center as you leave today and help spread the word. Ladies, are you looking for a place to connect and grow? Join us at Flourish, our monthly women's gathering and Bible study. It's a time for you to take a break from your day, grab your girlfriends, and be encouraged as we grow together in all that God has for us. Our fall semester of Flourish kicks off on Wednesday, September 2nd from 12 p.m. to 1 p.m. right here in the main auditorium, and this semester's theme is Stronger. Zechariah 4, 6 says, Not by power, nor by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord. God's Spirit empowers us with strength to live out the life He's called us to live. So come here from our very own Brandy Little this fall as we learn how to grow stronger together. Lunch is available for $7 and childcare is provided free of charge. We look forward to seeing you there. For more information about anything you've heard today, connect with us online for quick updates on what's going on around here. Thanks again for being with us this weekend.
All right, if you would, stand to your feet. At this time, I'd like to invite our ministry team down forward. I love what Pastor Jed said. So much of spiritual growth is relational, not necessarily intellectual. And so that's what these leaders are here. They're down here to be able to come alongside, to be able to encourage you, to pray with you. Uh, if there's anything that we can pray with you about. We're excited about where we're going. Got a big kickoff next week with our brand new fall series, Grow. Pastor Jeff will be with us. And so we look forward to seeing everybody right back here at Milestone Church next week. Have a great Sunday.